。大家好啊，到咗读你听嘅时间。今日咧，我哋继续读 Agatha Christie 嘅 Four Fifty from Paddington。咁啊，嚟到第十四节噶啦。咁上回啊，讲到咧呢、這个 Lucy Ice Barrel 喺呢个 Crackenford 嘅家族嗰度咧，系几咁受欢迎啦，吓。咁啊。包括呢個老先生在內啦，咁啊先後就最少有兩個成員、啊、就向佢求婚喎、哦，示愛喎、哦。咁啊，除咗一個咁啊,啊唱反調嘅就係 Cedric 啦。咁但係 Cedric 明明咧就係、是、先前同 Lucy 傾得好地地嘅，最平易近人嘅，可能係因為 Lucy 嘅自信啦、啊，嚇、啊、又或者佢。誒、呃、講説話少少啊，過咗火位啦，咁啊令到 Cedric 就覺得誒唔、呃、高興啩嚇、啊，都係一啲自尊心嘅作崇啦嚇咁樣。咁啊，文中亦都有提到咧，呢、這個探員咧阿 Credit 咧就話會去法國咧就查案，咁當然係查同呢個麥天有關嘅啦。而麥天呢個線索喺邊度嚟咧？就係、是。由 Emma 嚟噶啦嚇，哪怕係佢哥哥們嘅反對咧，佢都同呢個探員透露咗呢個麥天同佢啊四鬼哥哥嘅關係啦。咁樣咁咧嚟到第十四節，我哋睇下個故事會朝住邊個方向發展啦？究竟係去咗巴黎啊，定係留翻喺英國啊 ？OK，Chapter、okay, Fourteen。Dermot Craddock was fraternizing with Armand Desson of the Paris Prefecture. The two men had met on one or two occasions and got on well together. Since Craddock spoke French fluently, most of their conversation was conducted in that language. It is an idea only, Desson warned him. I have a picture here of the corps de ballet. That is she, the fourth from the left. It says anything to you? Yes. Inspector Craddock said that actually it didn't. A strangled young woman is not easy to recognize, and in this picture, all the young women concerned were heavily made up and were wearing extravagant bird headdresses. It could be, he said. I can't go further than that. Who was she? What do you know about her? Almost less than nothing, said the other cheerfully. She was not important, you see. And the ballet, Maritsky. It is not important either. It plays in suburban theatres and goes on tour. It has no real names, no stars, no famous ballerinas. But I will take you to see Madame Joilet, who runs it. Madame Joilet was a brisk, businesslike French woman with a shrewd eye, a small moustache, and a good deal of adipose tissue. Me, I do not like the police. She scowled at them without camouflaging. Her dislike of the visit. Always, if they can, they make me embarrassments. No, no, madam, you must not say that," said Desson, who was a tall, thin, melancholy-looking man. "When have I ever caused you embarrassments?" "Over that little fool who drank the carbolic acid," said Madame Joilet, promptly, and all because she has fallen in love with the chef d'orchestre, who does not care for women and has other tastes. Over that you make the big brouhaha, which is not which is not good for my beautiful ballet. On the contrary, big box office business," said Dessin, "and that was three years ago. You should not bear malice. Now about this girl, Anna Stravinska. Well, what about her?" said Madame cautiously. "Is she Russian?" asked Inspector Craddock. "No, indeed. You mean because of her name?" But they all call themselves names like that. These girls. She was not important. She did not dance well. She was not particularly good-looking. Elle était assez bien, c'est tout. She danced well enough for the corps de ballet, but no solos. Was she French? Perhaps. She had a French passport, but she told me once that she had an English husband. She told you that she had an English husband, alive or dead. Madame Joilet shrugged her shoulders. Dead, or he had had, or he had left her. How should I know which? These girls, there is always some trouble with men. 
When did you last see her? I take my company to London for six weeks. We play at Torquay, at Bournemouth, at Eastbourne, at somewhere else I forget, and at Hammersmith. Then we come back to France. But Anna, she does not come. She sends a message only that she leaves the company, that she goes to live with her husband's family. Some nonsense of that kind. I did not think it is true myself. I think it more likely that she has met a man. You understand. Inspector Credit nodded. He perceived that that was what Madame Joilet would invariably think, and it is no loss to me. I do not care. I can get girls just as good and better to come and dance. So I shrug the shoulders and do not think of it any more. Why should I? They are all the same. These girls mad about men. What date was this? When we returned to France, it was yes, the Sunday before Christmas. And Anna, she leaves two or is it three days before that? I cannot remember exactly. But at the end of the week at Hammersmith, we have to dance without her, and it means rearranging things. It was very naughty of her. But these girls, the moment they meet a man, they are all the same. Only I say to everybody, Zoot! I do not take her back. That one, very annoying for you. Ah, me, I do not care. No doubt she passes the Christmas holiday with some man she has picked up. It is not my affair. I can find other girls, girls who would leap at the chance of dancing in the ballet Maritsky, and who can dance as well, or better than Anna. Madame Joilet paused and then asked with a sudden gleam of interest, "Why do you want to find her? Has she come into money?" "On the contrary," said Inspector Credit politely, "we think she may have been murdered." Madame Joilet relapsed into in- indifference. "Ça se peut. It means it happens." Ah well, she was a good Catholic. She went to mass on Sundays and no doubt to confession. Did she ever speak to you, madam, of a son? A son? Do you mean she had a child? That now I should consider most unlikely. These girls, all, all of them know a useful address to which to go. Madame de Saint knows that as well as I do. She may have had a child before she adopted a stage life," said Credit. During the war, for instance. Ah, dans la guerre. That is always impossible. But if so, I know nothing about it. Who amongst the other girls were her closest friends? I can give you two or three names, but she was not very intimate with anyone. They could get nothing else useful from Madame Joilet. Shown the compact. She said Anna had one of that kind, but so had most of the other girls. Anna had perhaps bought a fur coat in London. She did not know. Me, I occupy myself with rehearsals, with the stage lighting, with all the difficulties of my business. I have not, I have not time to notice what my artists wear. After Madame Joilet, they interviewed the girls whose names she had given them. One or two of them had known Anna fairly well. But they all said that she had not been one to talk much about herself, and that when she did, it was so one girl said mostly lies. She liked to pretend things, stories about having been the mistress of Grand Duke, or of a great English financier, or how she worked for the resistance in the war, even a story about being a film star in Hollywood. Another girl said, "I think that really she had had a very tame bourgeois existence." She liked to be in ballet because she thought it was romantic, but she was not a good dancer. You understand that if she were to say, "My father was a draper in Amiens," that would not be romantic. So instead, she made up things. Even in London, said the first girl, she threw out hints about a very rich man who was going to take her on a cruise around the world because she reminded him of his dead daughter who had died in a car accident. Quel blush! She told me she was going to stay with a rich lord in Scotland," said the other second girl. She said she would shoot the deer there. None of this was helpful. All that seemed to emerge from it was that Anna Stravinska was a proficient liar. She was certainly not shooting deer with a peer in Scotland, and it seemed equally unlikely that she was on the sun deck of a liner cruising round the world. But neither was there any real reason to believe that her body had been found in sarcophagus at, Ruf- at Rutherford Hall. The identification of the girls and Madame Joilet was very uncertain and hesitating. 
It looked something like Anna. They all agreed, but really, all swollen up, it might be anybody. The only fact that was established was that on the 19th of December, Anna Stravinska had decided not to return to France, and that on the 20th of December, a woman resembling her in appearance had travelled to Brackhampton by the 4:33 train and had been strangled. If a woman in the sarcophagus was not Anna Stravinska, where was Anna now? To that, Madame Joilet's answer was simple and in- inevitable: with a man. And it was probably the correct answer. Craddock reflected ruefully. One other possibility had to be considered, raised by the casual remark that Anna had once referred to having an English husband. Had that husband been Edmund Crackenthorpe? It seemed unlikely, considering the word picture of Anna had been given him by those who knew her. What was much more probable was that Anna. Had at one time known the girl Martine sufficiently intimately to be acquainted with the necessary details, it might have been Anna who wrote the letter to Emma Crackenthorp, and if so, Anna would have been quite likely to have taken fright at any question of an investigation. Perhaps she had even thought it prudent to sever her connection with the ballet Marit- Maritsky. Again, where was she now? And again, inevitably, Madame Joilet's answer. Seemed the most likely, with a man. Before leaving Paris, Craddock discussed with Destin the question of the woman named Martine. Mart Destin Destin was inclined to agree with his English colleague that the matter had probably no connection with the woman found in the sarcophagus. All the same, he agreed the matter ought to be investigated. He assured Craddock that the Surete should do their best to discover if. There actually was any record of a marriage between Lieutenant Edmund Crackenthorpe of the Fourth Southshire Regiment and a French girl whose Christian name was Martine. Time just prior to the fall of Dunkirk, he warned Craddock, however, that a definite answer was doubtful. The area in question had not only been occupied by the Germans at almost exactly that time, but subsequently that part of France. Had suffered se- severe war damage at the time of the invasion. Many buildings and records had been destroyed. But rest assured, my dear colleague, we shall do our best. With this, he and Craddock took leave of each other. On Craddock's return, Sergeant Weatherall, Weatherall was waiting to report with gloomy relish. Accommodation address, sir. That's what one two six Elvis Crescent is. Quite respectable and all that. Any identifications? No, nobody could recognize the photograph as that of a woman who had called for letters. But I don't think they would anyway. It's a month ago, very near, and a good many people use the place. It's actually a boarding house for students. She might have stayed there under another name. If so, they didn't recognize her as a ro- as the original of the photograph. He added, "We s- we circularized the hotels." Nobody registering as Martine Crackenthorp anywhere. On receipt of your call from Paris, we checked up on Anna Stravinska. She was registered with other members of the company in a cheap hotel off Brook Green, mostly theatricals there. She cleared out on the night of Thursday, nineteenth, after the show. No further record. Credit nodded. He suggested a line of further inquiries, though he had little hope. Of success from them. After some thought, he rang up Wimborne, Henderson, and Carstairs and asked for an appointment with Mr. Wimborne. In due course, he was ushered into a particularly airless room, where Mr. Wimborne was sitting behind a large old-fashioned desk covered with bundles and of dusty-looking papers. Various deed boxes labeled Sir John Folds, Folds, Deck. Lady Darren, George Rowbottom, esque, ornamented on, ornamented the walls. Whether as relics or a bygone era, or as part of present-day legal affairs, the inspector did not know. Mr. Wimborne eyed his visitor with the polite wariness characteristic of a family lawyer towards the police. What can I do for you, Inspector? This letter. Craddock pushed Martine's letter across the table. Mr. Wimborne touched it with a distasteful finger, but did not pick it up. His colour rose very slightly, and his lips tightened. 
"Quite so," he said. "Quite so." I received a letter from Miss Emma Crackenthorpe yesterday morning, informing me of her visit to Scotland Yard and of ah all the circumstances. I may say that I am at a loss to understand, quite at a loss, why I was not consulted about this letter at the time of its arrival. Most extraordinary! I should have been informed immediately. Inspector Craddock repeated soothingly such platitudes as seemed best calculated to reduce Mr. Winborn to an amenable frame of mind. I have no idea that there was ever any question of Edmund's having married," said Mr. Winborn in an injured voice. Inspector Craddock said that he supposed in wartime and left it to trail away vaguely. Wartime," snapped Mr. Winborn with waspish. Waspish acerbity. Yes, indeed, we were in Lincoln's Inn Fields at the outbreak of war, and there was a direct hit on the house next door, and a great number of our records were destroyed. Not the really important documents, of course. They had been removed to the country for safety, but it caused a great deal of confusion. Of course, the Crackenthorpe business was in my father's hand at the time. He died six years ago. I dare say he may have been told about this so-called marriage of Edmunds. But on the face of it, it looks as though that marriage, even if contemplated, never took place. And so, no doubt, my father did not consider the story of any importance. I must say, all this sounds very fishy to me. This coming forward after all these years, all claiming a marriage and a legitimate son, very fishy indeed. What proofs has she got? I'd like to know. Just so," said Credit. "What would her position or her son's position be?" The idea was, I suppose, that she would get the Crackenthorpes provide for her and for the boy. Yes, but I meant, what would she and the son be entitled to, legally speaking, if she sh- if she could prove her claim? Oh, I see. Mister Winborn picked up her spec his spectacles, which he had laid aside in his irritation, and put them on, staring through them in at Inspector Craddock with shrewd attention. Well, at the moment, nothing. But if she could prove that the boy was the son of Edmund Crackenthorpe, born in lawful wedlock, then the boy would be entitled to his share of Josiah Crackenthorpe's trust on the death of Luther Crackenthorpe. More than that, he'd inherit Rutherford Hall, since he's the son of the eldest son. Would anyone want to inherit the house to live in? I should say certainly not. But that estate, my dear inspector, is worth a considerable amount of money. Very considerable land for industrial and building purposes. Land which is now in the heart of Brackhampton. Oh yes, a very considerable inheritance. If Luther Crackenthorpe dies, I believe you told me that Cedric gets it. He inherits the real estate. Yes, as the eldest living son, Cedric Crackenthorpe. I have been given to understand is not interested in money. Mister Winborn gave Cedric a cold stare. Indeed. I'm inclined myself to take statements of such a nature, with that, with what I might term a grain of salt. There are doubtless certain unworldly people who are indifferent to money. I myself have never met one. Mr. Wimborn obviously derived a certain satisfaction from this remark. Inspector Craddock hastened to take advantage of this ray of sunshine. Harold and Alfred Crackenthorpe, he ventured. Seem to have been a good deal upset by the arrival of this letter. Well, they might be," said Mister Wimborne. "Well, they might be. It would reduce their eventual inheritance. Certainly, Edmund Crackenthorpe's son, always presuming there is a son, would be entitled to a fifth share of the trust money. That doesn't really seem a very serious loss." Mister Wimborne gave him a shrewd glance. "It is a totally inadequate motive for murder, if that is what you mean." But I suppose they're both pretty hard up," Credit murmured. He sustained Mr. Winborn, Winborn's sharp glance with perfect impassivity. Impassivity. Oh, so the police have been making inquiries. Yes, Alfred is almost incessantly in low water. Occasionally he is very flush of money for a short time, but it soon goes. Harold, as you seem to have discovered, is at present somewhat precariously situated. In spite of his appearance of financial prosperity, facade, all facade. Half these city concerns does don't even know if they're solvent or not. Balance sheets can be made to look all right to the ex 
in expert eye. But when the assets that are listed aren't really assets, when those assets are trembling on the brink of a crash, where are you? Where, presumably, Harold Crackenthorpe is in bad need of money? Well, he won't have got it by strangling his late brother's widow, said Mr. Winborn. And nobody's murdered Luther Crackenthorpe, which is the only murder that would do the family any good. So really, Inspector, I don't quite see where your ideas are leading you. The worst of it was, Inspector Craddock thought that he wasn't very sure himself. 啊，讀到呢度就即係誒呢一章主要都係講 credit 嘅辦案啦。咁佢都叫做有效率嘅，都叫做問啱人嘅。即係包括呢個 Maxin 佢嘅誒芭蕾團隊啦，嘅團長啦，咁啊講一啲關於呢啲嚇 ballerina 嘅生活啦，嚇佢哋嘅。處世態度啦，嚇、啊、咁樣，咁啊得嚟嘅反應就係麥先生，即係麥先佢個人咧，唔好話生前啦，因為而家都唔確定佢係咪死咗。即係麥先佢個人平時係都係會講大話嘅人啦，嚇、啊，即係呢個根據佢團友嘅口供啦，咁變咗就會令到案情更加不明朗啦，係咪？咁啊，再者就係、是、誒、呃這個。Credo 翻到嚟英國就揾呢個家庭律師啦，嚇關問關於呢、這、一個誒、呃、假假設啊嚇，呢、啊這個 Maxine 佢嘅聲佢嘅宣稱啊，佢係呢個 Edmund 生前嘅合法嘅法妻，而佢亦都有個仔嘅。咁佢個仔呢，就會繼承所有財產啦，而個財產究竟係乜嘢財產呢？呢度問清楚啦，原來就係呢個 Rutherford Hall 啦，即係呢個大宅啦，呢、這個莊園啦，同埋佢嘅呢一塊地啦，啊呢塊地就十分值錢啦，啊呢 Estate 咧可能淨係維修費，我諗都價值所所費不菲啊，我相信，但係塊地我諗就最值錢啦，呢邊呢度呢度亦亦都有講啦，咁但係如果。咁但係如果呢、這個，但係如果呢一個 Maxine 嚇、啊、佢信入面所表示嘅嘢嘅內容唔係正確嘅話咧，即係話佢並唔係一名法妻，同埋佢冇呢個仔嘅話咧，佢就冇資格繼承啦。而下一位繼承嘅咧就係、是、Cedric 啦，嚇咁呢度亦都有提到阿、啊、Harold 啦，即係。即係話啊，佢又好似表現到佢好好多錢嘅喎、哦，生意好好喎、哦。咁但係呢律師就話實際上唔係啦。啊，而呢個 Cedric 係咪究竟係咪真係佢表現到咁唔貪錢咧？咁唔需要錢咧？佢都話佢冇見過呢咁嘅人啦。所以根據呢個律師嘅口供咧，即係當然佢亦都否定咗呢個 Maxine 嘅可信性啦。嚇、啊，即係佢唔佢唔認為，因為佢佢自己爸爸亦都係幫呢個 Prakenford。家族做家庭律師嘅傳代佢，佢都係第二代，即係以佢口供嚟講咧，佢就唔，佢認為係唔成立嘅，嚇、啊，佢認為就並無此事。而誒、呃、理論上咧，下一位繼承財產應該就係 Cedric 啦，嚇、啊。咁但係咧，誒、呃、佢會唔會唔要呢筆錢咧？咁佢即係似乎聽佢咁講就唔會啦，佢都係會要嘅。咁而 Harold 亦都係對呢筆錢虎視眈眈啦，而 Alfred 咧，即係個細仔啦，佢之前亦都親口講過話佢需要錢，因為佢要嚇、啊、做啲偷挖拐騙啊，都需要裝修下門面啊咁樣。咁所以即係話，其實所有嘅家庭成員咧，到呢一刻為止咧，都係、呃、仍然係有嫌疑啊，仍然係有嫌疑啊。咁就甚至乎呢一封信嘅撰寫人啊，姑且當佢係麥先先啦，都係似乎係出身不良喎、哦，因為似乎都係衝住呢一筆遺產而嚟嚇，係、啊、咁樣。咁啊，所以嚟到第十四節咧，案情係進一步複雜嘅，進一步迷糊化嘅，即係誒呢個 credit 要繼續查落去咧，即係恐怕不容易嚇。啊
，我亦都覺得佢會唔會需要更加多 Miss Maple、Miss Marple 嘅幫助呢？或者 Lucy 呢個卧底嘅吐料呢？我相信就需要啦，咁樣樣。咁啊，今日就同大家分享下三個字啦。今日讀過嘅。咁就、呃、第一個字係 a d i p o s e 呢個字我自己就比較少見嘅 a d i p o s e 咁啊，文中有提到呢，就係、是、佢形容呢個芭蕾舞團嘅團主啦，呢、這個 Madame j o l i e 啦，咁啊話佢話佢個身形啊,啊就其實係、呃、有好多 a d i p o s e 嚇，咁即係話其實即係意思就係佢係有啲肥胖嘅。啊 a d i p o s e 意思即係 body tissue，body tissue， 誒、uh, storing fat 咁嘅意思嚇，咁、啊、樣即係話佢係有啲肥胖嘅身體入面咧係載住有脂肪嘅，係啦。咁另外一個字咧就係 bruhaha 呢個字我真係冇見過 bruhaha， 咁佢出處就係法文啦嚇、啊，因為佢即係作者寫緊一個法國人啦，所以佢寫好多英文都係。來自法文咁樣啦，啊，咁啊呢個 bruha 嘅意思咧就係 a noisy and overexcited reaction to response to to something， 即係一個大聲嘅反應啦，一個或者你可以話一個誇張嘅反應啦，即係會哇咁樣一個嘅一個嘅個反應啦，可能你。你你誒睇電視見到個廣告，或者見到一個新聞，有一個好大嘅反應，都嚇嚇咁嘅反應，形容詞。最後一字就係 platitude 嚇，呢個係比較文中比較後面出現嘅 platitude。佢呢個直接用中文解釋啦，就係陳腔濫調，陳腔濫調嚇。咁誒文中咧出現嘅就係、是。當 Credit 話咗俾呢一個事務律師阿 Winborn 聽，有關於呢、這、一個呢一、這個誒麥先對自己身份嘅宣稱嘅時候咧，佢就係好憤怒啊，好嬲啊，反應好大啊。咁而因為佢覺得佢自己點會唔知道咧？咁樣咁而呢個 Credit 咧，佢就用一啲陳腔濫調，係用啲 platitude 啊。以 p a l i t u d e 去平息佢嘅憤怒，喺度講啲唉唔係咁嘅，即係可能呢啲咁樣嘅説話啦，即係唉事情都唔係你諗咁嘅，即係含糊帶過啦，去安撫佢嘅憤怒嘅情緒啦，就係咁嘅啫。其實就係咁 p a l i t u d e 呢個字都值得記一記嘅、啊、都比較有用。陳腔濫調、啊、就係咁啦。咁我哋下一回咧就係、是、第十。啦，咁啊，亦都係進入咗故事嘅一半噶啦，嚇，進入咗故事一半啦。咁啊，睇下案情會唔會翻去 Miss Marple 同 Lucy 嘅手中啦？睇下佢哋女人們嘅判斷啦，佢哋嘅佢嘅推論啦，又會係點樣？會唔會將案情帶上一個新嘅階段啦？好唔好？下次再見，拜拜。